So welcome, welcome, welcome to another fantastic episode of My Orgasmic Life. And today, I have my sexy co-host, Dr. Martha Lee. And she is a fabulous, I can't wait, we're going to have a really juicy conversation. So introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and what you do shortly, so then, and then we can get into the juicy topics. And then we can give you all the juicy details of who she is professionally at the end of the show. Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Martha. I am a relationship uh, counselor and clinical sexologist. I'm a born and bred Singaporean, and my practice is called Eros Coaching. Uh, what is, I think, unusual about me is uh, I went to the U.S., got my doctorate in human sexuality, and uh, two years ago, I also then got my master's in counseling, uh, and I've been in practice for 11 years. Nice, nice. All right, so for everybody who's like, who's this woman who's talking? <laughs> I'm Gaia Morissette. I'm your hostess with the mostess of My Orgasmic Life. Um, today's episode was brought to you by Tickle.life. <laughs> go check out go check out Tickle.life for all of their fabulous sexual education. <laughs> um, okay, so we had a conversation like three minutes before we went live here about what is really inspiring both of us and what is it that we want to talk about today. And we both decided to lean into the conversation of how to become a powerful woman in a society, in a culture, and in life where that's really frowned upon in a lot of ways. Even though we've come a long way in women's rights and, you know, there's still so much oppression and not only internal external oppression, but internal impression, um, oppression, especially around human sexuality. So where do we want to start? That's a huge motherfucking topic. <laughs> yes, it's huge. It's huge. Okay, so let's just treat this as a discussion, conversation. Yeah. Just say whatever we want to say. And I guess people can also comment and ask us questions. Yes. So hold on here. Let me, I have to switch back and forth between the screens um, to see. There we go. Um, so there usually is a little bit of a delay between you and I's conversation and what's happening on the Facebook page. Facebook, yeah. Um, but um, periodically, what I'm going to do is I, now I can see both screens happening. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to weigh in, then please, 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 please do. Um, whoever's with us live. Because that the more engaging you get with us, the more we can lean in. And the more juicy information you get from both of us. <laughs> so, and then that all that information is so powerful for our audience that listens later because whatever questions you have, whatever comments you have, it's about us coming together as women or us as a community. Never and I are just about women, just us coming together as a community. So, the more you engage, the more you'll get out of both of us. Okay, that's it. That's my promise. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I guess I want to um, start off by saying, um, even though both of us are coaches and we work with clients, um, it doesn't mean that we are <clears throat> better. You know, we are all human beings. We are all on the journey of working on ourselves. Uh, what we are offering here is sharing what we have gone through with the intent of maybe supporting more people and helping you to see um, some ideas of where you can go. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing I want to say is, you know, it's a bit hypocritical to talk about being women and being powerful women uh, when everybody's uh, journey, culture, background is so different. Uh, it's so important that we acknowledge uh, where we are at is very different from where you're at and what will make sense for you. 
a lot of times I feel when it comes to power, we look at people who are more powerful, who seem to have their act together, and we give away our power. We're like, yeah, here, here I am. Take it. Fix me. Yeah. Yep, and yep. my biggest worry sometimes with people going to coaches, counselors, is uh, not really understanding what it really what it's about. It's it's actually people who have done the work and people who have the training, putting on their hats, putting putting aside their lives to support you for that time. So the person that you see can be a very different person when they are not working, when they are not putting on their coach hat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I think people are going for the bright, shiny guru and they stop to question, actually, um, what, are, what, what actually are their training and credentials and experience and personal integrity. I think these are some things you have to be very mindful of instead of just going for the bright, shiny uh, person and well, giving I away your power. I think that's that the key the key piece is to not give your power away to anybody. It doesn't matter who you choose to support you on your evolution and your journey is that that you you they're there to support you, not to fix you. And so therefore, you don't give your power away and they don't want your power. And that's, I think, a really important piece of that, you know, moving from that place of integrity is that, you know, people often give me, want to give me their power, especially when I drop into the role of Empress Gaia and I'm in that, and I'm in that BDSM dominant space, right? People are like, yes, here, take it. <laughs> I'm like, no, this is your place, and I give that power back. And I think that's a really important piece. But let's talk about us. So how did you, what was your journey of becoming, what was the experience of being a woman? What were some of your struggles? And of becoming this powerhouse of the woman that you are in the world? Um, yeah, I would, I would say that um it hasn't it hasn't really it hasn't been easy uh being a a born and bred singaporean uh, deciding to step into um uh, being a space holder of positive sexuality in singapore and i wouldn't have been able to get to where i'm at uh if not for the fact that i have had my share of trials and tribulations including um, having had two divorces. Uh, the first one was when I was very young. I was married when I was 21 and I was divorced by the time I was 26. And that, that is, I, I never wish this on anybody. That is probably the hardest time in my life because you have this kind of like, you, this kind of a rule book Everybody says, okay, you do this, 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 and then you're set for life. And when all that gets taken away from you, um, the husband, the house, the, the idea of can I, can I have a kid? Is it too late for me? Am I used goods? I think a lot of times you start to question all these things that society puts onto you. And when you start to let that go and you start to unpack all these layers, you are left with who am I? Mm -hmm. And what do I want to be? What is important if I wasn't somebody's wife or somebody's uh, mother? And that really made me uh, go on a journey of uh, learning to really, really love myself. And, and uh, th that, that, that came into realizing that I really, really love um, helping people. I was doing volunteer counseling. I realized I had a gift for it. I was, I'm very sensitive and I was able to use those um, things that I know uh, to pick up clients' energy and support them in the best way possible. And um, so what were some of those? Even, so when you were, were you, when you were unpacking the, that place around like, okay, so what am I left? If I'm not a mom and I'm not a wife and I'm not that role and I'm not that, what and you started leaning in about how to love yourself what did you find what did you find yeah I, I i had to ask myself what is my worth and i started to question 
surely I am more than a mom. I'm more than a wife. I have value. Mm. And so I started to dig deep into what are my talents, my skills, my experience that I can bring. And if I don't have the skills and the experience, where can I go and get it? So that, that was the start of really asking myself repeatedly, what do I want to do? What am I here to offer? And if I was left on the shelf, if, if, you know, then what? <laughs> uh, so it's kind of like making, making something of uh, what is really um, not there and creating something. And even in our work, a lot of what we do is actually not tangible. No. Because we are offering a service, we are offering the essence of who we are and our experience. And uh, so by leaning into all that and getting the training, even when I started my practice, I still didn't realize that I still had so many things to learn. And one of the big, one of the big keys uh, was really understanding um, Tantra because I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't, even after sex school, I still didn't understand uh, what is the masculine and the feminine. And once I started to understand that we all have the masculine and feminine, I realized I was so masculine, despite how I look, I'm so masculine that I was probably scaring my clients. And I needed to lean into being comfortable with what was uncomfortable, which is to embrace my feminine side. I think being told your whole life that uh, you, and it's conflicting as an Asian woman, shut up, sit down, respect your elders, look pretty, don't antagonize, don't rock the boat, uh, don't create trouble. You actually uh, lose your voice. But then when you do speak, it just, it just like comes out in the most awful ways because in order to compensate for that fight, you actually become very aggressive. Yeah. And I understand that in our Asian culture, despite what people think of it, a lot of us are actually very uh, abrasive, a, a little bit rough around the ages because English is not necessarily our first language. And yeah. sometimes... To communicate, we can just chop chop say certain words to kind of like get the message through. The most important thing is just to get the message through. But then there are many ways we can get the message through and we are not probably very refined in the ways to get things through. But that's my experience. It could be different from other people. I do know of clients who are very feminine and they have a lot of difficulties even speaking up. So for me, I don't have difficulty speaking up. But when I speak up, I have to be very mindful that there's actually another way, another world of it's not just speaking, it's also the way you communicate. So I had to become very, very uh, familiar with the more gentler side of me that I didn't really get to know. Uh -huh. And uh, when I started to do that, I realized being a woman and being powerful doesn't mean being loud. Being powerful doesn't mean um, shouting, screaming, yelling. It also doesn't mean uh, being fierce or rude. Like there is great power in, in just speaking up and saying it in a way that the power is really there. If someone is powerful, they don't have to, they don't have to work so hard to prove themselves. No, no. Okay, my turn. <laughs> so what's your journey? So I grew up, uh, growing up in Canada, um, and I grew up in a, a space where I had very different, there was what society told me and what was happening at home. So at home, I was allowed to be anything I wanted. I could dress how I wanted, I could act how I wanted, I could be how I wanted. And there was never like, well, girls don't do that, girls don't do that. Girls don't do that. At home, there was no there. But in the rest of the world, I constantly, as a little girl, remember being like, being a girl sucks. Like, I remember really feeling like being a girl sucks. The boys get all these 
rights and privileges and they get to have fun and they get to explore and they get to do all these things. And so I just decided when I was a little girl that I wasn't going to be a little girl. I was going to be a tomboy. And so I made, like, for me, it was like, that was the way in which I fought against this societal oppression of that because I had a vagina that I couldn't build a fort because I had a vagina. I wasn't able to, you know, play sports because I had a vagina. I couldn't build anything. I couldn't build a tree house. And so I was like, mm -mm, that is so not happening. <laughs> so for me growing up, I had very two conflicting worlds of like trying to function in society and then having the freedom at home that gave me the right as a, as a female to do anything a boy could do. And so that adventure eventually came to a place of first I rejected being a female and then I realized, oh wait, I have a lot of power. Once I found my sexuality, and this is all before I did a lot of work and a lot of healing and, you know, all of those pieces, right? So let's just put that in, in perspective. So when I realized that I'm like, wow, these boobs I have give me so much power and power over, not power. And I think that's what the difference that we're talking about is there's a difference between having power over others versus power within. And, and so when I figured out my boobs gave me power over... <laughs> I started to utilize feeling the power that came along with my sexuality and learning to utilize that sexual power in a way that was very dysfunctional and unhealthy and unhealthy for me and unhealthy for others around me. But that was the first time I think I really felt like, oh, being a female gave me power as long as I used it from a sexuality and using my sexuality to get that power. Because before then, growing up, there was no power. You were powerless if you had a vagina. If you didn't, weren't born with a penis, um, you were at a disadvantage. And so I remember being a teenager being like, oh no, now I have a vantage. I have now that my sexuality here. And so I went on that journey for a while. And then I, I didn't really like other girls. I didn't really like other women. They were very catty. There was a lot of like infighting, lots of stuff. And yet, I end up in school in a feminist-based program. When I go to college, I'm like, I remember the very first day sitting in class, and there was like 80 women. There was no men anywhere. And I'm like, what have I chosen to do? <laughs> What's wrong with me? And that piece started my, I would say that moment really started me to understanding what it means to be empowered. And not, and, and not from a place of utilizing my sexuality to manipulate or power over others, but it meant how do I lean into being in harmony and balance between my masculine side and my feminine side and my non-binary side that gives me the opportunity to, you know, be neither of those, but all of them. And that really started me on my journey of like really holding my empowered self and because I moved from that place of empowerment that's why I'm a powerful woman because I'm not it's not external it's internal it's it's in love like you were talking about you know the journey of loving yourself I really love who I am it's that's taken I'm 45 and that's taken me a long time to get to there but I look in the mirror and I love who's looking back at me. And I feel like that's the, the source of my power. That's that source of when I walk into a room and I hold space and, and where I can be silent and quiet and still, like you were talking about, like being powerful doesn't mean that you're loud and obnoxious. And it doesn't mean that you have to be bossy and mean. Although, unless that's consensual, that's okay. But <laughs> it's like, I really think that it's that silence that, just that holding of space. Yeah, beautiful. I I have this to say about women who don't like other women. I I used to go through that as well, and that has to uh, do uh, that has to come more from the immature side of women, or the immature feminine, 
uh, which is we we are we have been hurt by other women and we we hold on to it and we start to become suspicious of of that as our reality and as we start to evolve uh, we realize that we don't need validation from other people and as we become relaxed in ourselves then it's much easier to have compassion for other women so when i i I went on this journey to heal my relationship with other women. Uh, what I did was I, I stay with the women that I can stand. <laughs> so you, you, you work with the women that you, you have some respect and reverence for. And from there, you start to realize not all women are the picture of the woman that you had in your past. Cause I, I, I was bullied, uh, in school and I was very, very, uh, skeptical of uh, women who were beautiful because the most cruel bullying that I experienced came from women who were beautiful. And so I didn't want to be one of these bitchy women. And so I, assu- I associated beauty with, with uh, fear. Mm-hmm. And as a result, I suffered because then I was afraid to be beautiful because I didn't want to be one of them. And also being beautiful, uh, putting makeup on, wearing nice clothes, whatever it is, when you get attention from people, uh, male or female, uh, it's scary because you want to you wanna protect yourself because we've been hurt. And so I actually say, you know, we, we, we dress up for different reasons, but I started to see dressing up as part of being brave. I'm there anyway. People are going to look at me anyway. Do I want to hide or do I want to shine? Mm-hmm. Because by hiding, actually I'm attracting more negative things. And I'm also not being congruent. I'm not being who I really am and I'm not happy. So when I'm happy, then better things will happen. I will have better friends. I will have better, I will attract better things, better partners, whatever it is, uh, abundance, abundance. Uh, money, opportunities. So people are drawn to people who are happy. It's easier to hide and and give up. It's too much work. I can't do it. But that's actually hiding. So mm-hmm. part of being powerful, I, I feel, is really understanding what being powerless is like. Because there was a time that I was hiding and I wasn't pretty and I was bullied and I was scared. And... I was only able to step into power by first recognizing I'm very very comfortable being powerless, but I'm done. I don't want to stay there because that's not the life I'm meant to have Mm -hmm. and taking small steps to reclaiming my power. What about yourself? So, yeah, I, I, I love the... So my journey around, I, I call it healing the sisterhood, right? And so it, in healing that sisterhood, I remember, and being in school, actually, in a feminist-based program really helped me heal this because I was stuck with 80 women. Like, I, there was no getting around it. Like, I couldn't just be like, oh, I'm going to go hang out with the boys over here, right? Like, I was, like, I was stuck. And the one thing that the program was so good at was really dissecting why we have this misogyny between women, why we have this hatred, why we tear each other down, what all that was about. And we spent a lot of time actually in school, really like pulling it all apart and dissecting it and figuring out where that comes from. And the thing that I always loved about that was this, all of a sudden this understanding that historically, throughout time, the only way a woman got any power was based on who she was mated to. So depending on what level of power and status in society she gained was depending on who she was attached to, married to. And so because of that, there's this, there was this underlining always trying to get the best mate in order for us to have power and status because we were completely powerless we were less we were seen less than human and so that's the only way that we could get any power was based on 
who we were married to. And so there was this constant competition and fighting of capturing the ideal mate in order for us to get power. So when I understood that, I was like, Oh, well, we don't need to do that anymore. Like we don't actually, you know, depend and I'm, and I'm depending on where you live in the world. And I think this is a really important piece. So depending on where you live in the world, that still might be your reality. Right. But if you don't live in a place of, in the world where that's your reality, we don't need to play that game out anymore. As women, we don't actually need to play out this historical dance of competition with each other to get a little bit of power. And so I always find that so incredibly, once I understood that, it was like, oh, I don't have to play. And then when I start to see other women starting to play that, I'll be like, hey, we don't, do you know what this game is really about? And then I tell them what the game's about. And they're like, oh, well, I don't want to play that game anymore. <laughs> and so instead of tearing each other down, we start to build each other up and we really bond with each other, right? In that support con connection piece. And so that's what I really loved about, about my journey around that. And so often, I mean, I love women and I love the sisterhood and I love spending time with women now, um, now that I know that, and now I can hold space. So when I see this starting to happen, this, this automatic cellular DNA reaction to this, this game that we don't even aren't aware on a conscious level that we're doing it or why we're doing it. Um, and it changes the whole dynamic. So I love that. That's, that's one of the things that I really love seeing happen when I'm in a group of women. Mm. It's amazing. It's amazing to see that transformation. Yeah. And another thing about power really has to do with survival and money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about money. <laughs> yes, it does. Well, when we drop into, when, we, when we're dropping into this place of power, whether we feel powerful or powerless has to do with whether we feel safe or we don't feel safe. And money and survival is a key ingredient to like, do I feel safe? Like it's, it's anchored for us as human beings in the cultures that we live in, that money is whether or not we have money. It depends on whether we get to eat, whether we're homeless. Like, so those base, the base needs of human beings are based on how much money you get, like how much money you make. And so if you're just trying to survive, meaning like you have no roof over your head and you don't know when you're going to eat next, um, then it makes it really difficult to move into a place of empowerment. You can't, you're just in survival mode. There's no possibility of moving into empowerment. You're just trying to survive. Yeah. And what is happening, I think, during these times with the coronavirus is it is shaking things up. It's shaking up companies, systems, institution, industries, and it's shaking up our lives. And it is a good time to relook what we have been doing just out of habit, what is serving us and what is not. And it, it comes back fundamentally to, do I have enough security for the next meal or the next month? Uh, was I looking into my savings? Have I lost uh, money because of the investments? Uh, do I have staying power? And I think one of the big pieces that I had to learn and I'm still learning is I gave away a lot of my power to the men in my life as they are supposed to be the breadwinner. As long as I find the right person, the right husband, he'll take care of me. I don't have to think about these things. It's too much of a headache. I'm not meant for these things. I'm not, I'm not good with money. I'm not good with uh, figures um, because, um, you know, I'm good in other things, whatever. I think we make these kinds of um, beliefs that needs letting go. Oh, yeah. Because we actually have uh, put our faith in the guru and sometimes the guru is the guru. Sometimes it is our spouse, sometimes it's our parents or the government to take care of us. And again, um, that is not taking ownership for our lives. And it's important to realize what are the lessons around it and to work towards healing them. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. So it's so important. Like, I love that, that piece around, like, all of the pieces that you, you know, we've been talking about and you just said, just really 
like brings home for me that when we feel powerless is when we give our power over externally. When we expect others, we want others to take care of us. There's this external space that, so if it's going really well, then great. But the truth is, is that because it's outside of us, then at any moment, it's fragile, right? So like at any moment, it could fall apart, <laughs> right? Whether it's like, you know, our government, a uh, spouse, a guru, uh, religion, uh, whatever, like whatever external source is the piece that's like anchored into, that you've anchored into taking care of you so that you can feel safe in the world. Yeah. Well, that, that the big problem in that for what I found is that it can all fall apart easily. And then you're left being powerless with no support, no skills, no ability to rely on your own self. And I think that as both of us were talking, I'm like, you know, I'm stringing together that the key to being powerful is being empowered, which means it's believing in yourself. And that the source of that power comes from within you, your trust yeah. in yourself, your loving yourself, your ability in your own worth, your ability to problem solve and adapt. And like all of these things is what creates that place of empowerment, which then turns in relation to the world perceives you as a powerful kick-ass woman. Yeah. For, for me, empowerment, because I didn't know what the word empowerment meant um and it wasn't until i met my first uh female mentor that was the first thing she asked me martha do you know what is empowerment I said, actually i really don't know uh and she explained it to me this way and i'll never forget it she said empowerment is taking back the power that has always been yours mm -hmm. it is yours it has always been there you just didn't know it mm -hmm. and the taking back of your power um, has happened several times in my life. Each time I uh, went through a divorce, <laughs> broke out with a partner, I had to come back into what am I learning from this? Who am I? And I went deeper and deeper into loving myself. I think at this point, people are probably wondering like, okay, we talk about it's not external, it's internal. So how do we build up this internal wealth of knowing yourself, trusting yourself, and I would even say having a, a certain sense of resiliency. So how did you um, find that within yourself? Um, there's a couple of different key moments, I think. Um, there was one, I went through a lot of trauma as a child. And so my journey of healing and reclaiming what it feels, what it means to feel safe. And so that journey of healing all of that shit and learning that I can feel safe and how do I create my world around me so that I'm in a safe space, that I'm always safe no matter what's happening around me. So that journey was a long journey. I just finished, a, and I just finished again another six months of like deconstructing, reconstructing, <laughs> rewiring my brain, all that kind of stuff, the next level of that trauma and healing that. So th I believe because of my experiences in life that that will continue. I'll always keep evolving, but there will always be an element of, for me, finding safety and creating safety within myself because of my trauma past as yeah. a child. Yeah, so that I, was I think a lot of people look at people that are in powerful positions and they go wow they are so lucky they didn't get there with because they were lucky and they didn't have any negative things in their lives at this point all of us have gone through trauma all of us have had negative experience it is the ones who shine the ones who are in people places of power or in service to other people they actually did not <laughs> did not have a better life they just chose to continue working on themselves. And part of the resiliency, I feel, is learning all these different tools that you have and I have that makes me feel no matter what happens, I know how to heal myself. And because I know how to heal myself, I am no longer scared. 
I think yeah. that that was one of the biggest breakthroughs for me that I actually had enough tools to heal myself so that I don't have to be in pain anymore. And there are yeah. so many people that I have worked with who are in pain, who didn't have the tools and that's why they are suffering and that's why they are hiding. But if we got support and we learn the tools for ourselves, we will no longer be afraid. I and have I, been through so many. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I like, I love that piece because yes, the people that you see are shiny and powerful and amazing. They fucking worked really motherfucking hard okay, to get to that place of healing their shit, of looking at stuff that's scary and uncomfortable and like being like, no, I'm not going to allow this to control my life. No, I'm taking back my power. No. And that yeah. journey, and it's a continual journey of self-discovery and self-growth and self-learning. And that piece, I love that piece because it is true. People that you see that are in positions of power, most of them got there because they did some work. They did the work that they needed to do to show up because being in the spotlight, regardless of what kind of spotlight you're in, is scary and it's vulnerable and you got to be brave and you got like it, it mirrors all of your shit comes up to the surface and you got to lean in there. If yes, you don't you, lean in there, usually you end up finding out you uh, do some pretty destruct, self-destructive things, drugs, alcohol, sex addictions, all sorts of things, because yeah. it's too much. But if you really heal, and like you said, getting the tools, gaining the tools, getting the people like you, like me, like others uh, like us um, to help give you those tools. Once you get those tools, it's yours. You it's yours forever. So it's, it's, it's well worth uh, learning. There was a time that I felt inadequate, that I felt like, you know, I need to keep learning and I, I am not good enough. I need to do the inner work. And at some point I realized at what point is, is where, am I ever going to be good enough? I need to also take time to pat myself on the shoulder and say, good job, well done. You've done a lot. And maybe not go for the next new shiny healing modality, whatever it is. It's great if it comes, but it needs to feel right. And it, it doesn't come from a place of I'm not good enough. I'm not healed. It comes from a place more of curiosity now. It comes from a place of let me pick up just another tool that I can support my client because I feel whole within myself because I really have enough tools. And one thing about tools uh, is that uh, they work for a time and sometimes uh, they work for a time and that's your favorite tool and it always works. And, and sometimes uh, there's a time and season for everything. And there comes this next thing that is probably more effective. It's not to say one is better than the other. It is what is better for you at that moment. So we, as we evolve naturally, our exercise, our food, our healing tool, can also evolve and that's part of the fun of being human that we are actually changing all the time we're aging all the time my cells are, are regenerating at, at every single second as i speak so there is no denying that change is a constant but people are so afraid of change they just keep to that thing and they keep themselves in that little box as if being that box will keep them safe mm, yes and that Even if you do nothing, I, I, but, will still happen to you yeah, and I think that's a great conversation that I should have you back for about talking about change because that's a big, that's like a whole big conversation. So let's, 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 what is the one thing in your journey of becoming an empowered woman? What is the one thing that you wish that you knew a long time ago that you know now? that you would pass on to our audience? Oh, um, okay. So I, I, I grew up in kind of like a, I have to admit, like a verbally abusive family now. And I was quite traumatized. And I was constantly overwhelmed. And I'm highly, highly sensitive. Uh, so it wasn't until I was 20, 
the I can't remember, but like in the last 10 years, I learned this tool. And once I learned this tool and really applied it, I realized it would change my life and it did. I was constantly overwhelmed. And because I was overwhelmed, I didn't have the power to fight for my life. I didn't have the power to really go for the thing without fear, knowing that I can heal myself. And the tool is called Linwell Releasing. And uh, there are many, many tools. And I'm not saying that, you know, they are better or whatever. But I'm just saying like the tool that worked the best for me is this technique called Linwell Releasing. In Linwell Releasing, it is the friend, the partner, the other side of affirmations. In affirmations, you use positive state statements. I am blah, blah, blah. I am beautiful. I'm strong. I call it brainwashing, but basically you're replacing your negative thoughts with positive thoughts. Yeah. Um, and you are trying to reshape your brain. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did affirmations and they did work for me. Um, but when I learned Linwell releasing, finally the two came together, the yin and yang, the masculine and the feminine. So with Linwell releasing, you focus on saying, I release, blah, blah, blah. So you follow the pain. Mm -hmm. And some of my favorite statements will include, uh, I release to take on what is not mine. I release to take on what is not mine. What is yours is yours. What is mine is mine. I release to be over responsible for this or that situation, person. We do need to be responsible, but what happens is we tend to be over responsible or over commit or over whatever, over smother, over, over. So it's not that we're coming from a bad place. It's we over, <laughs> overcook, overcook. Yes, uh, yes. Something. So my favorite tool is Linwell Releasing. Uh, I have a video about it. Uh, you can just Google it. Uh, you can just Google um, Linwell Releasing Martha. So L-I-N-D-W-A-L-L, -L, Linwell Releasing. So when I was able to start doing Linwell Releasing, uh, I, I, I would do it like, all the time, everything, every little thing that triggered me, uh, I release, I release my fear of being uh, hurt. I release my fear of bombing that <laughs> podcast. I release my fear of being late. I release my, uh, my judgment. I release my need uh, to be liked. I release. Mm. So basically you just follow the pain and it's like an onion. You think that you have released that layer, but maybe there are other layers. Always. So you just keep doing Always. it. And a lot of times what I notice is as I'm doing the releasing, I'm actually releasing what's conscious or what's happening in that day. That's immediate. That's top of mind. But as I start to maybe sit for a while and release, I start going into my childhood and the deeper layers. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many layers. So once I realized that for everything in my life, whether it's physical, mental, emotional uh, pain, uh, I could use this technique. It started to regulate the overwhelm and Beautiful. over time I stopped being overwhelmed and then I started to feel that I was really who I was meant to be and then I started performing Beautiful. so this is usually the first tool that I teach a lot of my clients who are in overwhelm because they're in overwhelm they cannot deal with the real issue that they're coming to me with so I teach them coping skills and there are many that I can teach but lean well is my favorite nice what about Okay, so one thing I want to leave the, leave the audience with today is, hmm, okay. Um, I think if you are a woman who's listening to this and you identify as a woman, I think the, the healing of the sisterhood is a really important piece. So that, I think, really leaning into that place around healing that so that you can change the world. And you can change your world. And because without the support, big part of being um, an empowered woman is it can be incredibly lonely. And it can be incredibly hard at times because you're going against societal norms. And societal norms say that we're supposed to look pretty and be quiet and not take up space. Like that's what we were been programmed to believe. And so if you don't have that sisterhood of support around you, it can be incredibly incredibly hard to stay in that place of empowerment. So 
the first thing I would suggest around looking at the sisterhood and where you play that game. Where are you playing? In what role do you play? Do you play the role of um, the, the woman who is being attacked, uh, tend to be, or do you play the attacker? And at some point, we've done both. So it's important that, you know, neither one of this is not right or wrong, okay? There's no judgment here, but it's important for us to observe what roles we play and why we don't need to play those roles anymore. So that's the first thing is where I would like you to sit down and take some notice of like, hey, you know, am I slut shaming? Am I power shaming? Am I like, oh my God, look at her. Am I beauty shaming? Like, what am I doing, right? And what I want you to do is to take all of those feelings and all of those paths, and I want you to throw them into a bonfire or flush them down the toilet. You just release it, release it, all right? In line also that is that, that piece that affirmations and rewiring and calling in is a very powerful tool, but there's no fucking room if you don't release the shit first. <laughs> release the shit so that you can call in what you want right so release all of those those judgments those fears those experiences throw them out throw them out throw them out throw them out once you've done that i want you to reach out to a woman that you admire and appreciate and just tell her start giving the women around you affirmations and compliments not because you want anything in return not because you, you know, are in competition, not because it's fake, but just genuinely, like, what do you appreciate about the women in your life? That could be, I really like your hair, to I love how you show up in the world. Anything is possible. But I feel like that's the shifting that's ha that needs to happen is instead of us moving from this hate and fear and scarcity space, for us to give this place of love and appreciation and admiration to each other. And when we start to do that, the more of us that do that, the more the world around us can change. So that's what I want to leave the audience with. Beautiful. Perfect. So how can they spend more time with you, Martha? Martha? I mean, I have all of your details and stuff, all of that, it, your, your bio, all that stuff in the show notes. But in case they don't get the chance to read the show, no show notes, Yes, thank you. Uh, you can go to my website, that's eroscoaching.com, and you can join my mailing list. You can also follow me on all the social media channels. It's also on my website. You can find me there. But the best place to go is just go to my website, eroscoaching.com. Beautiful. And thank if you. people want to spend more time with me, you can find me at succulentliving.com. For all your BDSM wellness needs, you can find me at EmpressGaia.com. Don't forget to follow me on all the social media platforms under Gaia Morissette and Empress Gaia. And don't forget, listen to this podcast, My Orgasmic Life, which can be found on every platform that podcasting lives. Okay? I've done my due diligence. <laughs> so, and I also have this great app where you can just directly download it from Google Play Store so that you always have me with you, always. Thank you for spending time with us. Thanks for listening. I'm proud of each and every one of you that have landed and stayed listening to this conversation. Mwah. May your day be filled with joy and pleasure and empowerment. Bye-bye.